A lot of high-profile, big first-person shooters came out in 2004. Half-Life 2, Halo 2, Metroid Prime 2, Doom 3, Counter-Strike Source. Notice something all of these games have in common? None of them are on the PlayStation 2. Despite being the biggest console of the early to mid-2000s, the PS2 wasn't really the place to go to get your fix if you wanted first-person shooters, and that makes some sense. Around this time, the FPS genre had become a space for technology-pushing graphical showcases. The PS2 wasn't the best place to make one of those. It was the most popular console of its time, but the least powerful platform that wasn't a handheld or something. First-person shooters were a really big deal, though, so you can't fault Sony for trying to get an exclusive FPS for their platform. And they really tried hard to make the most commercially appealing mid-2000s FPS possible. What's popular in first-person shooters right now? Interplanetary science fiction? And World War II? Let's just combine the two together. So in November 2004, amongst all these other first-person shooters, Sony published Killzone, developed by Guerrilla Games exclusively for the PlayStation 2. Set far in the future on a terraformed planet called Vector, a gang of plucky misfit soldiers in the Interplanetary Strategic Alliance, the ISA, have to prevent a brutal invasion from the Helgan Empire. The Helgast from the planet Helgan are a people who, according to the manual, lost something called the First Helgan War, and ever since have been living rough on their world where the terrible living conditions have caused them to mutate into big, hulking, pale, bald chaps. Scholar Visari unifies the downtrodden Helgast people into the Helgan Empire, an authoritarian, totalitarian, supremacist regime that now plans on invading Vector, partially out of revenge for the outcome of the First Helgan War. Thus begins the Second Helgan War will be experiencing in this game. So yeah, the allusions to World War II are not subtle. Probably could be assumed, but in the Killzone visual design book, Dutch studio Guerrilla Games, confirms that they based the conflict of Killzone on the occupation of their own country in World War II. The Hellgast are inspired by the totalitarian regimes of the early to mid-20th century, like Stalin's USSR, Mao's China, and of course, Nazi Germany. Now is our time! On the opposing side, the ISA is a futuristic take on the contemporary liberal market economies of today's quote-unquote free world. Basing the antagonists of your game off regimes responsible for some of the biggest real-life atrocities of the last century is a surefire way to immediately communicate to players who likely live in societies with an opposing ideology more in line with the protagonists that the Hellgast are bad news. What was really a stroke of genius, though, was the emphasis that was placed on these antagonists throughout advertising. Rather than depicting a larger-than-life character the player will be taking control of, the majority of Killzone's marketing and branding focused on the Hellgast, the characters you'd be fighting in the game. This made the series stand out in its early days, as the box art read more as a challenge to the player, instead of an invitation to embody some extraordinary individual. It was asking the consumer if they were up for the challenge of taking on this imposing enemy. Really, I bought this design book to see if Gorilla was inspired by Jinro when designing the Hellgast, but apparently they just liked the gas mask look and then added red eyes when playtesters were having trouble shooting them. Which, fair enough, I can believe that. I recommend reading Killzone's manual, because it provides more setup and world building than the game does, to be honest. Look at this, isn't this cool? It's made to look and read like an in-universe ISA magazine. It's got in-universe recruitment posters and adverts for fast food, all very liberal market economy style. There's little stories about the state of Vector during the invasion. Politician appeals for temporary ceasefire, and, and it's a section explaining how the pause screen works. This stuff's pretty charming to me. On second thoughts, maybe don't read this thing, it will make you miss game manuals. What will strike you the most about Killzone's gameplay is its stark indifference to the player. There's no music during gameplay in Killzone, no stings to punctuate the ebb and flow of battle. All you hear is the brutal sounds of gunfire and explosions, and the noise of people screaming at each other. <laughs> 
Even at full energy, you can be taken out fairly quickly, and health only regenerates a small amount on its own. Combine this with slow movement and you have a shooter that really forces you to take your time and methodically make your way across enemy infested land. Checkpoints are fairly scarce and scattered, making every step forward tense and laden with consequence. Despite being set in the future on some new planet humanity has settled on, the weaponry used here is fairly conventional and plausible. The look of Killzone is more similar to the near future shooters like Modern Warfare that would crop up a few years after it, rather than its contemporaries in the sci-fi shooter genre like Halo. This gives Killzone a bit of an original touch for an FPS, set considerably in the future but with a very grounded style. Killzone encourages disciplined, cautious play with a strict checkpoint system that can be pretty punishing. This will indeed have you considering what to do carefully, but inevitably when a game's main punishment for failure is to have you repeat big chunks of it, there's gonna be the odd frustrating moment. That frustration is compounded in Killzone as a slow-paced game. The least I think a hard game where you can die fast that has scarce respawn points should do is to be able to get you back in the action as fast as possible. Killzone is at its worst when it owns you and fails to do that, having you replod through fairly uneventful areas to get back to the meat of things again. You'd think for a game that chugs so much in terms of performance that Killzone would be outputting some mad visuals for PS2. But really, I can't say that it is. It looks fine, but I'd say the console has much better lookers in terms of art style and raw graphics, some of which uh, run a lot better than Killzone. I will say that there are some pretty large levels though. Environments can get pretty big, so yes. Those parts are pretty impressive for the system. But again, that performance, it ain't good. I don't know if any graphical quality would make up for how much this game chokes. I wouldn't really call Killzone a polished game in general. Low inconsistent frame rates, weirdly compressed audio. Here they come! Classic moments where you touch the wrong thing and instantly die. Repetitive looking environments, the melee kills feel weak and almost unfinished. Shooting feels pretty bog standard. It's not super satisfying, but it's not totally limp and unsatisfying either. Killzone 1 has potential that isn't really fully realized. The interplanetary conflict with real-world influence has a lot more to offer than just a pretty good manual. The story does capitalize on the premise a little, but not as much as it could have. You get four characters to play as, each with a different background and set of skills, who spend the bulk of the game trying to regain control over Vector's defense systems. One of them, Hacker, is a half Hellgate half Vectan character who defected from the Helgen Empire. Half Helgast, half human. He's distrusted by Rico, your heavy weapons guy, and the two bicker throughout the game. You bastards don't even give a shit about your own. Hacker is a pretty interesting character, and his dynamic with Rico is fun. Even a monkey will write Shakespeare given enough time. What the fuck is a Shakespeare? Seeing the two butt heads the whole game only for their battles to bring them together. Fuck this. Rico saving Hacker at the end is one of the game's highlights. It's probably the emotional peak of the whole series, to be honest. The thing is though, you also have Jan and Luger, your other two playable characters who are just kind of boring. Are you asking me if I got laid? <laughs> what? No, no. Jeez. They have some sexual tension, great, but they're just a bit generic. Vanilla captain protagonist and smug assassin. They're characters who don't really inform us much about the universe of Killzone the way Rico and Hacker do. They could be characters in any shooter with an army in it. I feel like more of a focus should have been placed on Hacker and Rico. I think their dynamic alone is interesting enough for a full game's worth of character development. Hacker, a great character to explore the Vex and Hellgast conflict with. Your mother pretends you're dead already. The rest of your family never even mention your name. Someone split between both factions who makes the choice to betray a side. Paired with Rico, a Vexen who hates and mistrusts all Hellgast. The Hellgast scum wiped out my entire platoon, and they'll be paying off that debt in blood for as long as I breathe. Sir. I see. It's the best part of this story, but I think it could have been taken further if given more focus. 
Taken in its totality, it's hard to call Killzone anything but fairly mediocre. But you can definitely see some cool ideas with potential for expansion. You can see why it would be worth making more Killzone titles. Better be worth all this bullshit. The next entry in the series came out in 2006 on the PlayStation Portable. Even though it's a small little handheld spin-off, I kind of have to talk about it since it was developed by Guerrilla Games. Rather than being outsourced to some other studio to make on the quick while Guerrilla focused on the next home console entry. As of writing, Killzone Liberation is the only non-first-person shooter Killzone game, which was probably a good move. Because if getting an FPS Killzone to run properly on PS2 was hard enough, imagine what one would look like spluttering along on PSP with no second analog stick to control the camera with either. It's a bit tragic, then, that the genre they went for this time, top-down shooter, still feels somewhat impaired thanks to the PSP's lack of that second analog stick, which could have made aiming, even in this context, a lot easier. Despite that, Liberation is a decent enough game. Set after Killzone 1, once again the player takes control of Jan Templar as, alongside Rico, he continues to fight off invading Helgan forces on Vector. There's not much to say about it, really, though. Take cover, pick targets. This time you can unlock extra missions that are perfect for a mess about if you're on the go with the PSP. These let you upgrade your character, which I recommend doing, as if you don't, the main missions are gonna be no joke. The fifth and final chapter of this game was also free downloadable content. Though with the PSP's online services down, you'll have to go to Gorilla's website to get the file for it now. It's funny because at the end of chapter four, where the credits role, since this is where the game ended before the DLC, Rico is currently in captivity. Are you okay? Yeah. But I lost Rico. So, if you don't get the fifth chapter downloaded where you save him, you'd be going into Killzone 2 completely confused as to why he's no longer in enemy hands. So yeah, there's no moment in Killzone 1 or Liberation that really rises any higher than decent. By themselves, they're not really games that would stand out much in the annals of gaming history. So it's really quite shocking how much of the quality gets turned up with the series' next entry. In the words of pop culture's most famous black gas mask wearing space totalitarian, this is where the fun begins. <laughs> 2009's Killzone 2 is an excellent shooter and a real triumph for Guerrilla Games, coming off the original's mixed reception. It takes the grounded, gritty presentation of Killzone 1's universe and elevates it with more intense gameplay and amazing production value. What struck me about playing Killzone 2 again 11 years after it came out is how incredible it still looks. And it's not all down to detailed assets, though those still do look sharp. There's a great emphasis put onto the little touches here. The bobbing of your gun when you aim the sickening lurches the Hellgast make when hit, the lights coming off your gun, the way bits of wall get chipped away when bullets make contact, the dark red blood that contrasts disturbingly well with the cold, muted environments. It seems like being unable to produce a PS2 FPS that could visually compete with the rest of the genre on other systems made Guerrilla and Sony determined to flip the script on PS3. And Killzone 2 absolutely does, delivering one of the most impressive-looking shooters out there. In a game that's this nasty, dirty, brutal, and real, it feels right that your character is slow and lumbering, as you carry these heavy, powerful metal death machines from place to place. A relatively slow turning and aiming speed here lends the weapons a realistic heft. As a result, your shots feel a little extra cathartic, when lining up and letting one loose out of these big chunky death sticks has this kind of build-up to it. This kind of heavy gunplay isn't gonna be for everyone, but what better place to double down on a shooter like this, geared towards realistic, harsh, ungraceful warfare, than a console exclusive. An FPS tied to thumbsticks, which are never gonna be able to replicate the speed and precision of a mouse. It's not like slow movement is a handicap that makes the game unfair if the enemies are playing by the same rules, right? The guns here all feel ferocious thanks to the aforementioned details, especially the sniper rifle. 
The way it jerks wildly after a shot just makes that shot feel all the more savage. For the time, Killzone 2 was one of the most raw and unsanitized shooters out there. Without veering off into being overly ridiculous or gratuitous, your hulking slow movement never becomes tedious like it could run the risk of in Killzone 1. Since here, while the moment-to-moment -moment combat is still weighty and deliberate, the overall pace of the game has been sped up substantially. You're almost always kept in the action, plus environments are less repetitive, you get to see new places at a faster rate. Checkpoints are now less punishing too, as a result Killzone 2 was less challenging than 1, but also less frustrating. It also meant I felt more encouraged to try wild card tactics, which again helped the pace of the game as I wasn't always tiptoeing through being ultra cautious. The crouch button here also now will attach you to cover, allowing for quick peeking in and out of said cover. I think a cover system makes a little more sense for first person shooters than third person shooters. As in first person, it can be harder to gauge if your entire body is in cover when you can't see your character's entire body. A command that tells your character to take his head, scoop up his limbs and tuck it all behind something can therefore be quite useful. In a way, a third-person camera simply gives us more visual feedback than our bodies offer us in real life to make up for the senses a game can't replicate as accurately. Senses like touch and proprioception, which in real life let us know where all our body parts are at at a given moment without looking at them. Therefore, including a button that quickly toggles you in and out of cover, giving you some reassurance that you're going to be more protected once that button is pressed, adds up in a first-person shooter, especially one with relatively slow movement played on a controller with fairly low field of vision. In an FPS like Killzone, where repositioning is a slower process than some other shooters, a function like this is welcome. Popping your head in and out of cover can be done more swiftly and reliably, without compromising on the deliberate heft your character exhibits throughout the rest of play. They even added background music. In Killzone 1, a lack of background music was more apt. You travel much longer distances in Killzone 1, with enemy camps placed in between you and a faraway destination. Killzone 2 focuses less on travel and guerrilla warfare, and more on a lot of back-to-back -back chaotic large-scale conflicts for control over a location the game has already placed you into. So some score to complement that intensity of play, I think is warranted. This time the game takes place on Helgen, the Helgast homeworld, as the ISA invades to capture the Helgast leader, Scholar Visari. Helgan was partially inspired by Hong Kong, and that kind of compact urban setting lends a real intimacy to your battle with the Helgan in the early segments. Helgan perfectly paints a picture of Helgast's society. Grim slums that contrast with the self-importance of immaculate colossal marble structures built to honor those who command and control the planet's military might. A lot of noise is made about Killzone 2's quote-unquote reveal in 2005. A target render of what Killzone 2 could theoretically look similar to, which Sony claimed was real footage of the game running. I think it would be wrong to let this marketing blunder overshadow just how good Killzone 2 did end up looking. With all its detail and with how tightly paced some of its linear enemy encounters are, I think Killzone 2 comes closer than most FPS games to actually feeling like a playable first-person cinematic. There are some segments of my footage that look like they were scripted for some E3 demonstration, but it's just me casually playing the actual game they released. Visually, I think Killzone 2 looks more appealing now than the fakey fake target render ever did. The game is less focused on interpersonal drama between the members of your squad than the original. This time around, you play as just one character, newcomer Sev. Your four-man squad is then filled out by the returning Rico and two other newcomers, the upbeat Gaza and the foul-mouthed Natko. Do you understand why I'm here? 
I guess your mom got drunk with the guys one night. You are next. I ain't got all day. I gotta get home in time to tuck guards his mom in. <laughs> the team aren't amazing characters with much development, but at least there's a fun dynamic here between everyone. All it takes is a little finesse. Finesse my ass. The fact you can't pick who you play as anymore is not too much of a loss for me. The differences between each character in Killzone 1 weren't vast enough to encourage me to replay any level as a different one. I think the highlight of Killzone 2's cast has to be, of course, one of its antagonists. Colonel Raddick. Raddick is so memorable for a lot of reasons, even though he's not actually in the game or the series that much. He has a cold, chilling voice, imposing design, and manages to kill a pretty major series cast member. Didn't I kill all of you yet? But I think what makes him stand out is that he's basically the ultimate Visari Hellgast. Early in the game, the player can overhear two Hellgast discussing how Radic executed two grunts for uniform violations. Two grunts from our unit got executed by Radic. No shit. What for? Cowardice? Defeatism? Violations. I shit you not. Extreme and barbaric, but as we come to discover that extremism was born out of ideology rather than him simply flexing his power. When you defeat Radic in combat at the end of the game and he's unable to prevent Sev and Rico from taking Vasari's palace, he executes himself. He must have viewed those grunts he killed as soldiers who failed to see their commitments to the Hellgast through. And when he too fails at his own mission, he gives himself the same punishment. He wasn't just some high-ranking, selfish Hellgast with a lust for personal gain and power, but he seemed actually, sincerely, to be extremely, perversely devoted to the beliefs and philosophy of his world's regime. The Hellgast I feel will always live on. That extreme devotion, coupled with his considerable combat ability, makes him the ultimate example of a Hellgast soldier to appear at any point during the series. He's definitely the character I think of most when I picture that iconic helmet. He's their ideals and aesthetic cranked up to their highest intensity. If I had to pick a standout moment in Killzone 2, it would be the final assault on Visari's palace. Moving up towards the palace as the Hellgast flood out, slowly gaining ground, pushing back, thinning them out just enough so you can move to the next barricade, until little victories finally pile up and you've made it to the front door of the stronghold. It's an amazing moment, the red tint of this level reflects that you're at the beating heart of the Helgen army, and they're throwing everything they have at you. Whew. So that's the peak of the series. Killzone 2's campaign elevates the series to this compelling, unique place where pacing, gameplay, visuals, tone, setting all come together in a tight package. Yet 2011's Killzone 3 seems like it wants to backtrack all of that. Killzone 3 kind of drops the grounded future aesthetic in favor of giant thousand foot tall mechs, laser guns, fleshy alien habitats, sleek high tech sci fi labs, and big crazy bug knife robots. Up to this point, Killzone was pretty light on overt sci-fi technology. The warfare and its weaponry was conventional and rudimentary. The environments weren't overtly futuristic at all. Even spaceships and hovercrafts looked fairly basic and flashy, looking more fit to be delivering cargo than hastily deploying troops into a war zone. There were hints of more advanced tech and alien abnormalities here and there. Radix Camo, the odd oversized spider. One of the most out there concepts in 2 was the special power source native to planet Helgen, Petricide. But in 2, it's portrayed as like this kind of souped up electrical current, while in 3, the irradiated version of Petricide is like this magic obliteration energy. A lot of Killzone's uniqueness came from this fairly utilitarian future world it chose to present its warfare. In. That all changes in Killzone 3, and what makes this change all the more jarring is that it literally takes place five minutes after Killzone 2. We see the story continue on from the exact same building Killzone 2 ended in, yet it feels like we're on a totally different planet in a different time. Where were these giant mechs five minutes ago in Killzone 2 when I was fighting the Hellgast? I'm sure they would have come in handy. Also, the character Natko basically disappears when he was right here a minute ago. They just 
just completely drop this character from the story without much explanation. He only shows up in Killzone 3 if you play the campaign in co-op, where he'll be the second player. He still won't be in the cutscenes, though. I don't know, it's just odd to demote this character from the status of well, being a character, to just a skin for whoever is player two. In theory, the premise here is that you and the gang are stuck on Helgen after landing a significant blow to the Helgast, and you have to survive here with no evac in sight, with the Higgs on your tail madder than ever. A gritty low-stakes game about surviving on Helgen as a small group sounds very Killzone, but that premise is kind of dropped and the game decides instead to escalate into a big save the world mission, as the Helgast plan on nuking and destroying all of Earth. It's kind of a sudden raising of the stakes, even for the series as a whole. Considering Game 1 was about gaining control of a defense system and Game 2 was about arresting a guy, I guess they wanted a blowout finale for the third game. But it's weird to see 3 start low-key and then switch gears so suddenly near the end. I don't know if there is a way to switch those gears more smoothly in a 5-hour FPS campaign without it, you know, coming off a bit silly. In general, Killzone 3 is way more over the top than previous titles. I get that the melee used to be pretty unsatisfying, but did that mean we had to include crazy execution kills? Where you push your thumbs through the Hellgast helmet's visor eyes, shatter them, and then somehow crush a dude's skull underneath? Like, would that even be possible to do? What is this, Duke Nukem? In terms of gameplay, Killzone 3 seems to want to up the pace a little. Hints of this can be seen in the aim sensitivity. 2 started you at 50% speed by default, and 3 starts you at 30% by default, but 30% in 3 is much faster than 50% in 2. Meaning that to get a similar sensitivity to 2 in 3, you'd have to drop the sensitivity to like the lowest setting. This indicates to me that Gorilla wants you to play with faster aiming here, shifting Killzone towards being a more fast-paced shooter overall, even including this slide move you can zip around with. Which is odd, because I always assumed Killzone's weapons had a realistic, hefty weight to them, which would prevent power sliding while holding them. I felt like I had a lot more sudden deaths in Killzone 3 too. Maybe it's because the levels are less compact than 2, more open, making it easier to get hit from afar by multiple foes. No matter what the reason, when playing on the same difficulty across both games, 3 would wipe me out suddenly on far more occasions. However, Killzone 3's quick deaths don't really make the game harder and therefore encourage any kind of style of play, because they included this revive system where Rico can bring you back to life in a lot of levels with no real penalties to speak of. You don't have to use the higher aim sensitivity and slides to dash around and be fast on the draw, or even conversely take your time and watch your every move like in Killzone 1. Any new playstyle the game might have wanted to encourage is kind of made void. Rather than these quick deaths making the game harder, they were just inconvenient and mildly annoying. The revive system gave the game this kind of awkward stop and start pace. Unlike Killzone 2, where you'd always get set back when dying, success being dependent on you pulling off a nice, satisfying string of continuous gameplay, you can bumble through a lot of Killzone 3 in stark contrast to where we started in 1, where there was no messing around. The faster aiming default and revive system end up feeling like band-aids placed over a game that was running the risk of becoming frustrating the way it's otherwise designed. Slightly more lenient gameplay without the revive system I think would have been a more satisfying experience. I say that because Killzone 2's gameplay left me a lot more satisfied. The game also has an odd obsession with rail shooter levels, it even ends on one. With an entire analog stick out of play, these segments are much less compelling than regular gameplay. Maybe one would have been a nice change of pace, but the amount in 3 seems overkill. The turret sequence in 2 wasn't a masterpiece, but again, it was an okay change of pace. Getting to spend some extended time above the clouds of Helgen, rather than down on the cluttered surface like most of the time. But more importantly, there was something tasteful about it. It wasn't trying to put you on a theme park ride and give you a tour of some crazy imagery. It was trying to simulate what getting into a turret on a big battleship would be like, again in a fairly grounded way. You get into this cockpit and there you are, stationary, just hanging off the edge of the sky. Nothing but a cracking piece of glass protecting you from thin air. And that's in general one of my big issues with Killzone 3. 2 does have an almost simulation approach to its warfare. It's gunplay weighty, it's look bleak and un forgiving throughout, 
the tone consistent, the combat brutal and shocking, without veering into the ridiculous. I came to expect a series that was marrying grim real-world history with plausible dark science fiction. Instead, with 3 you get this occasionally bleak, but usually pretty crazy and ridiculous game that throws all sorts of exaggerated sci-fi concepts, crazy mad scientist villains, and over-the-top situations at you. Something you'd more expect to see in some kind of light-hearted space adventure game. Not the dark, gritty World War II allegory Killzone had been up to this point. Feels jarring all of a sudden for a Killzone to be like this. And I think this new direction hijacks what had become a really promising direction with Game 2. I think it really lacks some of the details I mentioned in the Killzone 2 segment that really brought out the grit of the combat. <laughs> Taken as isolated segments, there's of course parts of Killzone 3 that are pretty fun to play. The jetpack section was a cool mix-up, I suppose, adding an extra layer of verticality to the combat. You also don't have Rico here to bring you back to life, so this part can be a bit of an enjoyable challenge. Even though I do think the idea of Hellgast blasting off and bouncing around in these vulnerable-looking rickety things is kind of silly and makes them a little less threatening, the Hellgast are all about looking imposing and dominant. These lurching, wobbly jetpacks don't look like they'd be approved. But Liberation let you use a jetpack during a few sequences, so I'm, I'm not gonna say you're not allowed to have one in Killzone. The one in Liberation did look a little less wacky, though. I'll also acknowledge that I haven't really touched on competitive multiplayer modes in this video. The online play was a big part of these games. Unfortunately, most of them are no longer online, so I can't really revisit them. Just gotta use bots now, which is never gonna feel the same. I never got too into Killzone 2's multiplayer, though I know that was a significant portion of the Killzone 2 experience for a lot of people. But I did play a good chunk of Killzone 3's multiplayer and I have fond memories of it. The base siege mode was a lot of fun, especially with buddies. Infiltrating the enemy base, planting explosives, and then seeing yourself and the gang in a little cutscene dashing out of there, hella satisfying. If you want a pretty game with competent shooting, you could still, of course, do a lot worse than Killzone 3. And I would like to emphasize that some of what's here still does look amazing for PS3. Just what it's rendering most of the time doesn't feel very Killzone. But why this change in direction? Well, I'm gonna speculate about that a little later in the video. But before we get to that, I wanna talk about Killzone Mercenary for the PS Vita. 2013's Killzone Mercenary wasn't developed by Guerrilla Games, but by Guerrilla Cambridge, formerly SCE Studio Cambridge, the studio that bought us Medieval. Usually I might skip portable spin-offs not made by the original studio behind the franchise in a retrospective, but since it's the only Killzone game not made by Guerrilla, it would seem silly to leave this video incomplete. I also want to talk about Mercenary because I actually quite like it. Once I got over the fact that like Killzone 3, Mercenary was going to be making use of a much more glossy, high-tech sci-fi aesthetic here and there, I actually found a pretty cool little shooter here with a fun premise for this universe. As the title would imply, you play a mercenary who throughout the game takes jobs from both the ISA and the Hellgast during the invasion of Vector and the invasion of Helgen, so in a cool twist we get to fight for both sides of the conflict. If fighting for the Helgast seems unpalatable, don't worry. ISA Admiral Grey is introduced who's trying to develop some kind of viral weapon that would wipe out Helgen, so she's up to some pretty evil stuff too. Admiral Grey made the conflict more grey. Bravo. Leading the Helgen side of things, we have Kratek, who has the coolest Helgast design of them all. Popped red collar. I guess Helgast uniform regulations do become a bit more lax as you rise in the chain of command. Also, to make your amoral, doesn't take a side, cool protagonist more likable, the game gives you a child to protect. Hey, every film about an edgy comic book character does it. Tying into the mercenary theme, in this game you gain cash for kills, which you can then spend on new weapons and tools to deck out your loadout with. You get rewarded with more money for more efficient and skilled play and get deducted money if you die. It encouraged me to mix up my approach and play consistently with these new extrinsic rewards on the line. I'm not saying I'd want this in something like a Killzone 2, but for a mercenary-themed Killzone, it's great. 
There are some cool settings here too. You have the Vecton Embassy on Helgan, which has these cherry blossom pink plant things. Maybe it's a callback to the park on Vector in the original? Maybe. You know, they're both pink. I like the idea of a level that can plausibly combine the aesthetics of Vector and Helgen. The level kind of fits the game's theme nicely, the fact you're dabbling in both sides of the conflict. Here we encounter the most underrated Killzone character, Boris the Hellgast. I is using marks to do their dirty work. Typical Vectors. Yellow as piss. You fight alongside him to protect that kid, and I don't know, he's just a lovable tough guy with a heart of gold. Killing civilians. That's not soldiering. That's the lowest of the low. I also like this cool Helgen fishing town built into the side of cliffs and rock formations. It's a place visually in line with what you'd expect an industrialized, unsanitized Helgen fishing town to perhaps look like. It's neat, even if its scale does seem a bit implausible, but it looks like it belongs on Helgan more than a lot of places in 3. Mercenary isn't a groundbreaking FPS, but for a short handheld romp with quality graphics, it's hard to do much better. At least, I guess, before the Switch came out. The upgrade system encourages playing on, even perhaps after beating the campaign and getting that top level gear. So the game is perfect for a little bit of pop out and play wherever you may be to rack up some kills. It's weird to say that it's probably my second favorite Killzone game, second only to two. Which yes, means I wasn't a huge fan of Gorilla's next entry in the series, Killzone Shadowfall. Shadowfall was released the same year as Mercenary in 2013 as a launch title for the PlayStation 4. And, uh, yeah, this one's gonna be quite a tricky one to talk about. I don't really know where to begin with this one. There's gonna be spoilers for Killzone 3 from this point on, cause... Cause they're basically required to understand this game. So at the end of Killzone 3, a series of events led to your team, I guess, accidentally nuking the surface of the entire planet of Helgen, which as you might have guessed, ends the war. So in Shadowfall, the ISA take in all the surviving Helgen refugees, which makes sense. It's the least they could do. I'm with you so far. Rather than trying to integrate both cultures into one society, they build a giant wall dividing the planet into two, and the ISA let the Hellgast forcibly remove all current Vecton residents from their homes if those homes happen to be on the side the Hellgast were given. Now things are getting a little more questionable. Accepting the Helgen refugees makes perfect sense, but why would the ISA allow the Hellgast to self-govern on Vecton soil and keep autonomy over their own military. How did the Hellgast negotiate for this insanely good deal after Killzone 3? What did they have as leverage here? In Killzone 2, simply arresting Vasari was considered a good enough goal for the invasion, considered an outcome that would place the ISA in a position of strength over the Hellgast. But the whole planet getting reduced to rubble after 3 somehow still leaves room for the Hellgast to have bargaining power? What situation is there left beyond the new king of the whole planet that would leave them with less bargaining power then? I feel like this planet-wide new king must have ended any advantage Helgan had over the ISA, right? And yet the Hellgast get given half of Vector and the people living there lose their homes or die. Thanks for winning that war, ISA! Are even Helgan citizens super stoked with Vasari's regime continuing in its classic totalitarian style? Is this Helgan gentleman pumped to still be living under Vasari law? They treat the people so badly. Thank you. Pause yourselves. The police are everywhere. Obviously, with the whole war thing, after doing World War II in space, Gorilla wanted to do a Cold War kind of thing in space. A West slash East Germany kind of scenario. But unlike Killzone 1 and 2, which were fairly analogous to World War II, this scenario isn't really analogous at all to post-World War II Germany. This is like if Britain blew up Germany and gave Scotland to the Nazis. The conflict in Shadowfall is more like an amalgamation of all sorts of different real-world split territory slash border conflicts. Of course, it's not such a big deal the story doesn't fit the real-world chronology of World War II. It's more of a problem for me that the events leading to this scenario in Shadowfall don't make much sense. What was the ISA's rationale here? Why don't the ISA attempt to demilitarize the Hellgast and try and have both societies coexist. That would come with its own hurdles, but surely those hurdles would have been lesser than the ones created by forced relocations and this Mexican standoff divided society situation they create 
which inevitably does boil over into war again. It seems like Gorilla thought about how cool a city split down the middle between Vecton and Helgan society would look, and it was like, whatever, okay, get us to that scenario no matter what. And it is a cool setting, but the justifications given for it in-universe were so flimsy to me, it killed much of my ability to take it seriously and get invested. With this new status quo awkwardly put into place, Shadowfall tries to tell a more nuanced story than past kill zones, aiming to explore a greyer conflict. Both sides. As the ISA and Hellgast forces scheme against each other on either sides of this great wall. This time, the ISA getting up to some very bad stuff themselves, and not even accidentally, but given who these factions are based on, I think Gorilla quickly ran into a bit of an issue. When one side of a conflict is a liberal market economy, and the other is totalitarianism, how do you critique the liberal market side without looking like you're condoning totalitarianism? And how do you criticize the totalitarianism without looking like the only alternative you have for it is the liberal market economy's side? Offering credence to boomer memes that all bigotry disappeared into a puff of smoke because LMEs like North America and Britain won World War II. <sighs> I just wanted to make a video where I said I didn't like the graphics in Killzone Shadowfall. Lol. You should put this entire post you just wrote in your script. Heck, post a screenshot and read it out. I'll read my lines. The answer Shadowfall lands on is to make both of these sides just act extremely terrible. And then, for better or for worse, pieces out without a solution for that. Mercenary had a bit of this going on too. But I can see how throwing in a more bloodthirsty ISA higher up we hadn't heard of made sense in a game where at points you were going to be fighting for the Hellgast during a period of history where their fanaticism was at its peak. Shadowfall wants to put the focus squarely on exploring the intricacies of this relationship between these two cultures, but the result feels both awkward and half-baked. You play as Lucas Kellen, whose father gets killed by Hellgast soldiers during the mass settling on Vector. He carries out covert operations ordered by Thomas Sinclair, the guy in charge of the ISA presence on Vector, known now as the VSA. It quickly becomes apparent that Sinclair has a deep prejudice towards the Helgen race. These people are animals, all of them. And as Shadowfall goes on, we get to see an ISA who behave just as badly as the Helgen regimes have been depicted so far in the games. They put a deadly biological weapon into production designed to wipe out the Helgen race. There weren't many Helgen on board to begin with. Whatever it was, it killed them all. Their flesh, it just started falling off their bones. The humans on board are fine. No side effects, nothing. Now I understand what Massar means by ethnic bullet. After a terrorist attack, the ISA on the spot deport all citizens of Helgen descent over to the Hellgast side of the wall. We now have an ISA just as supremacist as the Hellgast ever were. So here, perhaps, Gorilla are trying to say that the liberal market economies, the quote-unquote free world they mention in their art book, can end up resorting to methodology and behavior very similar to that of outwardly totalitarian societies. Societies that that free world claim to be in opposition to. I found a weapon. Every day, new Helgen continues to exist. We are under threat. We can remove that threat. But that kind of message ends up being undercut by the fact that the game never actually asks the player themselves to do anything too morally questionable or reprehensible and perhaps grapple with the reality of taking orders from a side that's long since abandoned the moral high ground? You'd think taking orders from a bigot and being someone whose own father was killed by the members of the race your boss has basically been raising you to hate, that Lucas Kellen and you as the player would be tasked with doing some pretty horrible things in the name of a perceived greater good. The player and Kellen could be put into an awkward position, forced to do anti-Hellgast missions, then endanger or end the lives of Hellgast who don't deserve it and who aren't committed to the ideology of those in charge. Make Kellen reflect on his assumptions through gameplay in a powerful way. That's not something the player gets to experience firsthand, though. It's convenient that when Kellen goes on a mission, all the Hellgasts that get put in front of your crosshairs are portrayed as evil psychos, still worshipping a dead, warmongering dictator and tyrant, justifiably upset about the destruction of their home world, albeit in an evil voice before vowing revenge. I lost my entire family here. Everyone. I was the only person in my family who survived. There will be a reckoning. Vector will be ours. The civilians will not be killed. We will give them a chance to leave. And if they choose to stay, that is a different matter. 
The Helgen side of the wall has been turned into one giant slum, despite the Helgast having complete autonomy over a land that started out rich with resources. In a lot of cases, it seems like you're doing the citizens of the Helgast side a favor by breaking into their land and playing cowboy. They set you up as this attack dog for this morally bankrupt ISA, but when it comes to the gameplay, I don't think Gorilla wanted to undermine the series brand, which is... Isn't it fun to take on the scary helmet men? That's perhaps where the game is at odds with itself. It's like the game is saying, yeah, sweeping bigotry against this fictional race is bad. But you did still kind of buy this game to have fun shooting them, right? Don't worry, most of them are still portrayed as amoral monsters. While Kellen does eventually go rogue, it's not because he ends up contributing firsthand to some kind of reprehensible act his bigot boss has sent him to commit. It's just because a Helgen lady tells him that war is bad. Seems like a bit of a waste of a setup. S Sinclair's not supposed to be in the right, right? Because the Helgen race aren't predisposed from birth to be evil totalitarians, right? They're not orcs from Lord of the Rings, correct? They are innocent people! No! They're not innocent, tell them. It's been my assumption that they're just people capable of multiple points of view from the very first cutscene of the series, where we see Helgen's not on board with Vasari's regime getting executed. Gorilla have really managed to muddy the waters, though, by having this weird constant where any defecting Helgast who fights alongside the player is always depicted as of mixed descent. Half Helgast. Half human. Which, considering how much this trope gets revisited, starts to imply you need some vexing in you to not like totalitarianism. Well, there is one Helgen who isn't implied to be mixed, who fights against the interests of Vasari alongside the player, the true unsung hero of Killzone, Boris the Helgast. Yellow is piss. One of Shadowfall's problems is that the nuanced pitting of these two opposed sides, fighting a proxy war as close neighbors, doesn't end up mattering much. The VSA and Helgast, both independently developing powerful weapons away from Vector, kinda overshadows any conflict actually happening in the Split City. Such hoops are jumped through to get us to this Split City setup and the riders might as well have not bothered. Because the game ends up boiling down to everyone fighting over super weapons away from Vector and the city. Super weapons which weren't developed on Vector and the city. <laughs> By the end, Shadowfall entirely opts out of this tricky border situation it presents, saying, While both sides in their own time built some super weapons somewhere else due mostly to resentment over the war, and at the end of the game our protagonists are gonna try and stop them being used, which I think we can all agree is the right thing to do. Well great, that really gets us out of any tough conversations involving land control, law enforcement, security, foreign intervention, emigration, rights, and this whole shared planet situation, when the only big choice our protagonist has to make is, yeah, I think we should shut down these off-world super weapons before they're used. I'm pretty sure Shadowfall is a game that just wants to say that bigotry is bad and war makes monsters of us all but I think it does it in a very convoluted, yet superficial way, that a lot of the time wastes the potential of a setup it bends over backwards to get us to. I think the issue is, I don't see a story with themes and messages when I play Shadowfall as much as I see writers straining to make a great conflict out of two competing systems where one of the systems is based on some of the real world's worst regimes. Nobody wants to be seen as condoning some monstrous totalitarian regime in their video game by making them in any way sympathetic. So there's only two options, really. A black and white conflict where the totalitarians are in the wrong, or a grey one where they're in the wrong, which can therefore only be made grey by making the other side very wrong too. Maybe the Helgast shouldn't have still been devout supremacist totalitarians come Shadowfall. But again, if you don't make them that, then your series can't be about guilt-free shooting these guys anymore. And maybe a series that wants to be about guilt-free shooting some guys shouldn't try and make a game about a grey conflict. If these were just two random alien races with poorly defined ideologies, it probably wouldn't be such a big deal to depict them however you wanted. But Killzone has been analogous to the real world since day one. So unless Gorilla were to make a Killzone game with completely new factions, they're stuck juggling the heavy implications that come with how you frame fictional regimes based on real ones. I've been discussing this aspect of things rather than just making fun of the various plot inconsistencies because it seems to be what Gorilla wanted us to do from the beginning. 
This is a series that wanted to be seen as something more than just a shooter. I'm just meeting it on its own terms here. Shadowfall has a plot that goes to such dumb lengths to get us to an interesting status quo. With the split city, we have the Hellgas still around with a massive army so we can still have a game about fighting them even though it wouldn't make sense for them to have this kind of military might anymore. So with all these contrivances, at the bare minimum, I think the game could have made more out of the alliance of Lucas Kellen and Echo, the mixed race Hellgast special agent you team up with to try and stop. Both sides. With everything said, there was at least an opportunity here to make two likable characters that embody the series conflict and create a more compelling version of Hacker and Rico's relationship from the first game. But if anything, these two end up being less compelling than the OGs. Kellen barely speaks. When he does, it's just basic stuff to keep the plot going. You tried. We find Stahl. This ends. Echo just kind of exposits to Kellen here and there, acting annoyed she's having to do whatever she's doing. They don't really build a rapport or exchange any banter that makes you care about their team up. They miss an opportunity to make you care on a personal level that these two people keep getting forced to be apart by being on opposite sides of this conflict. They could have been a really cool duo where the effects their respective cultures have had on their personality and outlooks shine through via their conversations. Maybe by coming together, these two could have proposed a viable alternative to the systems perpetuating war in this universe. Two people from either side coming together to find a way to create peace between their two nations. But instead, the search for any long-term fix gets supplanted by the need for these two to shut down the big ridiculous doomsday weapons as quickly as possible before they can be used. Two pretty strong soldiers going rogue, unsurprisingly doesn't solve the issues of this world. I agree with the game that this isn't a solution to things, but it solidifies how Shadowfall only really has a bit of grim fatalism to push for its final message. As the game comes to a close, and this whole series with it, I guess, since there hasn't been any more Killzone since Shadowfall, what we're left with is a real downer cap to this franchise. Echo assassinates Sinclair during a live public broadcast, which will stop him personally using the biological superweapon to kill millions, but having the credits be summoned by the public assassination of the VSA's leader, an assassination the VSA will no doubt assume was carried out by the Hellgast, can only be inferring that the conflict between the two sides is destined to continue on indefinitely. It frames the whole series as a bleak, cautionary tale about xenophobia and mistrust winning out, but to me it rings kind of hollow. Three ended on such a full stop, a devastating end to a war, an end that gets warped back for the next game just so we can ultimately say, and the war never ended. That walk back kind of undermines the ending. This cynical open-ender, this bitter back and forth in Shadowfall, takes place after we've been detailed one of the most generous giftings of land in the history of the universe. Putting aside the jumbled story and its themes, stylistically Killzone Shadowfall was kind of doomed to not click with me, since it moves away even further from the visual and tonal approach on display with earlier games like 2. The series has committed now to this colorful, bright, sleek, ultra-futuristic aesthetic. Is this Killzone or Deus Ex Human Revolution? On top of that, the levels have become much larger than they've been before, or at least since 1. And also, they've become slightly non-linear from time to time. Occasionally getting the choice for what to do next isn't a bad addition, but I think the scale of these stages hurt the experience for me. There's now a lot of time spent traversing large areas between enemy encounters, where there's just nothing much going on. Killzone used to be relentless. You were in the kill zone, out here fighting for your life. In Shadowfall, I spend half the time trying to find enemies to fight. So what is my theory as to why Killzone slowly moved away from gritty dark warfare to colorful sci-fi adventure with a little robot sidekick? Well, in the late 2000s to early 2010s, in cool gamer criticism circles, a bit of a backlash was brewing towards a perceived oversaturation of quote-unquote brown and grey shooters, usually linear ones with short campaigns and some kind of multiplayer mode. Being a shooter with more deliberate gameplay, aiming perhaps to portray the grim reality of grounded, unembellished war zones, 
or worse, not being colorful, had started to be equated with a lack of creativity in gaming discourse. Maybe this is a tad anecdotal, but that's definitely the vibe I got. When I was younger, I probably held that stance too from time to time to look like an enlightened gamer going against the grain. Grim shooters had started to become a more predominant force in mainstream gaming, but I think the backlash started to frame that kind of experience as inherently inferior to more light-hearted games with more over-the-top extravagant scenarios and a high variety of colors. As if more color and not being very grounded or realistic equals being more creative somehow. In response, I think shooters did try for a bit to up the saturation a little and get a little less grounded in reality, with more over-the-top fantastical scenarios that wanted to be perceived as more exciting and crazy and fun in a more traditional sense. Big robots, kaboom, lasers, badass takedowns, etc. It feels especially off to try to do this with Killzone, rejig it into an over-the-top rollicking sci-fi adventure, but while also keeping the extreme blunt violence and mass murder of its predecessors. Even trying to jazz up the once bleak violence by portraying it as hella epic or funny in places. Your king went down like a pussy. Whoa, pussy. It almost makes me feel a bit uncomfortable, if anything. The grittiness of Killzone, I think, was kind of integral to the series. Killzone 2's uncompromising, bleak, dark, dirty approach to warfare. Its focus on that was kind of the selling point, more so than the average war shooter at the time. It's definitely what made it stand apart from cleaner, more colorful sci-fi shooters like Halo. I think Killzone 2 was one of the best examples of this aesthetic ever. The grit of Killzone, the bleak, overwhelming chaos. I think that could have been a more sustainable identity for the series if it needed to go on for six games, rather than the prolonging of the one conflict, ISA versus Hellgast, all the games decided they kind of had to be about. By going more colorful and futuristic, the Killzone series just ended up blending into the crowd, as a lot of shooters got more exaggerated and overtly futuristic to be perceived as fresh and bold. If expanding the audience of the series was the objective, though, I don't think there's much chance of convincing people who didn't want to play Killzone 2 to play a Killzone game by making it more bright and sanitized. Plus, you might end up losing the interest of people who were already invested. I think people complaining about brown and gray shooters were more looking for new series with a lighter tone to scratch their itch, rather than having franchises they didn't play or didn't like the look of bend to their whim. Call of Duty went in a more colorful, futuristic direction with faster gameplay around the mid-2010s, and more recently, 180'd back to the more successful look and tone of its late 2000s titles, when the new direction was met with a lot of negativity from longtime fans. Not that one type of tone will guarantee you success at any point in time, the aesthetic still has to be high quality, as does the gameplay, but I could see a polished kill zone with a darker aesthetic really capturing people's attention around the mid 2010s, and especially now. Nowadays, a lot of popular shooters are colorful, fast paced sci fi shooters, and perhaps Due to that oversaturation, some of the least popular shooters are too. If Killzone had committed to its bleak aesthetic, it probably would have been more noteworthy going into the early to mid 2010s. Perhaps the change wasn't a cynical move to placate an audience. Maybe Gorilla really did feel constrained by the aesthetic of Killzone 2 and wanted to shift the series' look and world so as to better serve original concepts they wanted to try. But maybe a whole new series would have been the place to experiment with a new style and tone rather than a Killzone game that takes place right after the previous one. Given what the style evolved into in Shadowfall, maybe there's a better place to try that than a series called Killzone. I think with Horizon, that's what Guerrilla have decided to do by shifting focus from Killzone over to a new, colorful IP with big robots. Unlike Killzone 3, Shadowfall at least has some excuses for this change in direction. The game's name makes reference to the fact you're playing as a Shadow Marshal, the stealth class from the original Killzone, so it's implying at least that you should come to expect a game more focused on stealth and dashing about, perhaps. The title also takes place decades after the original trilogy, so it's not a total or stretch that technology would have evolved. A change in direction is one thing, but what hasn't really been the case since the original is how unpolished Shadowfall feels. The quality of the environments and characters is a bit uneven. The game also opts for these first-person cutscenes, which are excusable in a portable game like Mercenary, but Killzone up until Mercenary has always had, like, fully edited cutscenes where you see the player character. They 
didn't point the camera at the mocap actors and do one long take. It's not like this is done to achieve some kind of immersive first-person experience. Like when I finished doing this turret sequence and the game just faded out into a first-person cutscene that's gonna take place somewhere else, rather than me walking somewhere next and having the scene seamlessly trigger. Even if the transitions were super smooth, first-person cutscenes aren't even a stylistic choice the game fully commits to. I can think of one cutscene that triggers randomly that doesn't have the player character there at all. The old games did that too, of course. It only feels out of place in Shadowfall because it only happens one time here. Making the game overly colorful also results in a visual overload sometimes. It used to be easy to identify what was what in the Killzone series because the odd bright color contrasts well with the muted environments. But now it can be really hard to read what is what at a glance, with everything glowing at you. So many sources of bright lights, hard to tell what's an enemy visor and what's a bit of random set dressing. I encountered some legit wacky moments too. Like when I planted this bomb and then went off to hide while it detonated because because I assumed it would attract attention. The bomb went off and then enemies spawned directly into my hiding spot. Systems down. I guess this just happened to be the place where enemies were programmed to spawn in once my bomb went off. But if that's the case, why let me come in here at all? Have these doors lock once the bomb's planted? Look at this guy over here too. He runs so far away after this. Where's he going? Is he off to tell the devs about what just happened? Let me know if this next one happened to you. There's this bit where you're flying up towards a ship and at the top I kept getting completely stuck. Glued to the top, barely able to move. It took me a few reloads before I flew up and ascended to the right spot. Now when I load up the chapter, this doesn't happen, but I swear on my first time up, I was, I was glued up here, alright? Anyway, this is where the series leaves off and what a weird series it ended up being. A series that started wobbly but pushed forward until it delivered on its vision in a spectacular way, but then seemingly and suddenly backtracked that vision. Who am I to say what the vision of Killzone should or shouldn't be, I guess, but I think in this day and age, a shooter series that continued more in line with Killzone 2's presentation and gameplay could have legitimately stood out more and thrived. Instead, to me it felt like Killzone kind of petered out, running all over the place trying to do so much at once in each campaign, instead of nailing one direction. Like Killzone 2 did, I'm a broken record. Now I don't see as much vocal fanfare for the series anymore. I think this is a case where if Guerrilla wanted to make something different, they should have just done that, instead of grafting those new creative ambitions onto the Killzone series. The outcome is an awkward series of games that seems to start meandering by the franchise franchise's second half. These later games feel a bit unfocused, lacking cohesion, as they try and marry the brutal grounded warfare and dark real-world inspiration of the first kill zones with exaggerated fantasy sci-fi action and ridiculous technology. Right now it seems like Guerrilla have moved on, but if they ever do return to Killzone, I think a game in the style of 2 would be the best way to go. Not just because it's my preference, but again, because a shooter like that I think would genuinely stand out in the market of frantic, fast-paced, sanitized, colorful shooters of today. I think there's room for every style of shooter on the market. But I also think Killzone was best off occupying one of those styles and trying to excel in one space to the best of its ability. So yeah, that's what that whole Killzone series was about. Thank you for watching and thank you for your patience between uploads at the moment. This video went through a lot of iterations before finally getting finished. An extra special thanks goes out to my Patreon supporters who have been backing me during this video's production. You're seeing the top backers scrolling by you right now. If you'd like to help support the channel and get exclusive extra content like short form scripted video reviews of more recent games, please visit patreon.com slash thegamingbritshow and consider backing. Peace out, and see you soon.